people friends, everywhere. Friends. I love it. Kate Bowler's in the house. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you are killing me. This makes me so happy. And it's ridiculous, so they, thank you. They, they have a choral anthem. Oh, that's right. right? <laughs> that's right. Jazz hands, it gets weird. All right, Kate, thank you for being with us. We're honored to have you. Uh, I took some notes here to get us started. Let's see, first of all, we can skip the uh, Peloton ad. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I like a good outdoor workout. I've been listening to her podcast which has given me uh, podcast envy. Like I've talked to cool people in my podcast. Good grief, you've had uh, Stanley Tucci and Matthew McConaughey <laughs> and you get Ann Patchett and she sounds more excited to talk to you than you are to talk to her. Oh, who would not be thrilled to talk to Ann? It's ridiculous. And then you had, and my favorite was Tara Westover. Yeah. That was the most moving podcast. Oh, that's She kind. was absolutely amazing. I guess the nicest part of this, I mean, if you can say there's been a lovely bit to cancer, but there's been a lovely bit to cancer, which is that I had never felt so desperately in need of hearing other people's stories. Because there's, you know, there's like lessons and there's things you can read, but there's that weird alchemy of when you hear the truth borne out by somebody's life and then it creates a kind of magic. And so, it, I guess that was one of the first moments when I thought, well, I'm going to figure out how, I'm, I'm going to need to learn to live like this. And the only way to do it is with other people. So, and the best fun tonight would be if we could sit with each one of these people individually and Weirdly, hear their stories. Weirdly, we're going to lock the doors and yes. each one of you will be forced to. It's going to take a while. So, <laughs> uh, so Kate, uh, people that I, uh, think about a lot, I tend to abbreviate their names. So like ML is Martin Luther. So KB, here to four, has been Karl Barth. And you, you've not quite supplanted him. But one of the things that Karl Barth said is that uh, sin is taking yourself too seriously. Huh. So you're, you're funny. I mean, that is a compliment. Why, does, why do you think humor and laughter matters or hmm. helps us. Hmm. I like that. Sin is taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, I mean, I guess I also think that sometimes for me to, I mean, for any of us possibly to get at the truth of something, either very good or very bad, you kind of have to hit it sideways. Mm. And being loving, absurd, I don't know, some people, like I was talking to Sweet beautiful, lovely Beth Moore, and she was like, I love to appreciate God through wonder. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so spiritual and so good. And I was like, I love to appreciate God through like Minnesota's largest ball of twine. And, but the truth is like, if I'm going through something really awful, I'm like bringing up that app called Roadside America, looking for the largest scissors, which is not far from here. So I don't know, there's something about absurdity that lets me hit the like octave, like the high and the low at the same time, and then I'm like, okay, this is doable. So uh, I told Rob Webb the other day, a uh, question I wanted to ask you right off. So uh, my history with you, I didn't know you when you were growing up, when you started teaching at Duke Divinity School, uh, there was just, I was an adjunct faculty person, and there was this buzz in the hallways. There's this rock star woman who's teaching. I didn't even know yet. Like, that was like amazing. I was a 12 year old who was talked into joining the students' improv group and things like that. So it was probably more like, right. what is happening? Yeah, what is this? And then uh, we heard the story of your cancer. And then you wrote uh, the book, Everything Happens for a Reason, which I think, as I pointed out to you in our podcast, I'd written the same book a few years before, but you're funnier, you're more eloquent, oh, and you had cancer, which I want to get back to in a minute. But right into the question I told Rob I wanted to ask you is, oh, this is okay. What's it like being Kate Bowler? Oh, it's um, pretty weird. Uh, well, I, you know, I think I like, um, my parents are very weird. Uh, 
my mom was converted by a tract. I think maybe the only person in history who ever got like a three-fold piece of paper and was like, sinners in the eyes of God, all right. But, um, and then my dad was a historian, and so I think I was, I was Socrates, I think grade two, Halloween. Um, and then the next year I was a lamp. So I don't know, I guess, I guess the thing I loved about um, growing up a little odd was that you get to watch the world from the outside in. And then the second I felt like I belonged anywhere, it felt like it mattered so much to me to translate my own experience across the bridge that I had always been on the other side of. So I think I felt the same way actually when, when I got diagnosed, it, it kind of felt like a return to a familiar feeling. Hmm. Like I was on the other side of glass and other, all the world of the sick and the happy and the Instagrammable were on the other side. So it's been really a, a surreal and beautiful feeling to feel like the alienation we feel from ourselves is, happens in seasons and I get to be a part of other people's. So my favorite of your books, they're all great, uh, is No Cure for Being Human. And um, I love this moment where you, know, you go to the doctor and you've been battling cancer and then the doctor says, well, the report has been amended. Second radiologist probably hasn't had a chance to look at it yet, but now it doesn't say tumor here at all. And you said, what does it say? I'm breathless. It says fat deposit. <laughs> we burst out laughing. So you're saying I'm not dying, I'm just fat. <laughs> it's it's all cake. happened, yeah. A two centimeter fat deposit is, is not cancer. So not cancer. So uh, two questions. One is, how are you doing now? people will want to know. And second question is, uh, I asked you this in our podcast, uh, people expect after a story like that for you to say, God healed me, it was a miracle, but I've not heard yeah. you say that. So how are you doing now and how do you think about not having cancer? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm careful about it because I spent my entire 20s studying faith healers which we did, we all did that. We all trial used our 20s interviewing televangelists and going to Israel with Benny Hinn, as we do. Uh, it's a hard scrabble world and that's how we make sense of it. Um, but I, I, I had spent so long um, listening to the way that sometimes faith can crowd us into corners where we have to say that everything is wonderful <laughs> or then we have to say everything is terrible in order to get the attention that we need to actually survive our lives. And so when I'm doing well, I always don't really want people to worry about me, but I'm also really careful because um, sometimes health is a season and sometimes it's not. So I've been doing really well for the last uh, year on and off, but I'm also like intermittently scanned where you kind of, I, go, I just have like slightly bumpy years all the time. So like in the Smokey the Bear uh, forest fire, um, this hand, uh, which I feel like I should just do this hand. Um, but like it, I'm not red and I'm, I'm kind of where yellow touches orange. Uh, so it keeps me in that place of gentle precarity, I would say, where I'm unbelievably grateful for my health but I don't uh, really run around saying I'm cured. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested, uh, this is an odd thing, uh, in preparing for this, I don't know why, I got intrigued uh, with your dad. Your parents are probably both interesting. But your dad- <laughs> I'll tell Karen. Is like yeah. the, the world expert on Santa Claus. He is, yeah. Like, it's, go figure. It's always like a long car ride in July and he's like, I think he's just about to say something really sweet about how we're both historians and we love each other. And, uh, and then he's like, "Hun, what's your favorite Christmas carol? And I'm like, oh, we are not having the same emotional experience right now. Um, so, but he, so, but he pops up, I've heard you mention him in your podcast and your book. I mean, I've, I told you this. At the end of uh, No Cure for Being Human, you and your dad are at an unfinished cathedral in Portugal. And yeah. that's kind of a parable for a lot of your writing, right? Yeah. Is that things are unfinished, it doesn't seem like it's enough, but is it enough? Yeah. And then, you know, I emailed you when I finished this. I was awestruck by the last page of your book. All of, and this is like your dad's words. Like, it's wonderfully unnecessary, isn't it? And then you write, all of our masterpieces, ridiculous. All of our striving, unnecessary. All of our work, unfinished, unfinishable. 
We do too much, never enough, and are done before we've even started. It's better this way. I, I love that. <laughs> and when Pat Conroy came to Charlotte years ago, he was signing books, and I took the Lords of Discipline to him, and I said, would you sign the last page of your book? He smiled. He knew why I was asking him that. Second time in my life. Would you sign the last page? Oh, I love you. That's so book. kind. It's, so, it's the best last page ever. Aww. That's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> I come here for compliments, guys, and we can just wrap this up. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our work here is done. I, it's... Um, Th this, this giant cathedral in Portugal that has, that they just kept, they've just kept building for centuries and centuries. And my dad calls it like the high watermark for architectural doodly dads because they would just take a, a perfectly good column and be like, you know what this needs? is about 200 pineapples. So they would just ornament it endlessly. And having spent so long now thinking about progress and self-help, and especially the pressure it places on women, here we are at the end of our January feelings, where <laughs> we were supposed to be better by now. <laughs> and we never are. <laughs> it's nice to have the sense that like, the unraveling that we have is, is just a it's, a, it's, it's an acknowledgment of our humanity it's not uh, that it's almost February and that we've failed by now. So this is a book tour for your uh, newest book. What a lovely like cover, it's colorful, it's bright. We, uh, we ran out in our bookstore, we have more coming. You had book plates that you gave out. Thank you for signing those for people. I want to just dip into a couple of things here to ask you about. I asked for the saddest flower and we declared it to be the thistle. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what it's like working with me. <laughs> it's more special than I knew. <laughs> yeah. yes. So toward the end, uh, you have an, an episode that's called Good News is Hard to Find. And it has the thing we were talking about a minute ago. Let me sense you with me here in this unfinishable life. But then it's one that begins, these prayers, if you haven't dug into this book yet, it, it's poetic, it's moving, it has powerful images, it's just absolutely wonderful. And don't read it beginning to end. I've been skipping around and looking for a topic like, I need that topic today, Aww. it works well. But this one, like, this is like Gaza right now. Oh God, this world and its peoples are hurting, and everywhere we look, there is something to lament. We look for hope that peace could break out. Oh, God, when will the relief come? Like, you sound like a psalmist there. You know, I wanted to ask you, ask, I forgot about this. I wanted to ask you about this. You are, so you're a scholar. I want to ask you about that. A lot of church people don't understand what it means to be a scholar in the field of religion. They think if you go to div school, it's kind of Sunday school 2.0. And if you get a doctor like we have at Sunday school on steroids, you're a scholar. How does your scholarship impact this work that you do that's immensely popular with the masses? Well, I think, so one of the weirdest, uh, most helpful parts to me is I tend to obsess over a historical problem uh, that I am afflicted with. So with the prosperity gospel, it was really digging into, well, if, how did this story about God's abundant promises of health, wealth, and happiness actually come to transform all of our expectations of what we could expect in a life. And for the last few years, I've been studying um, secular prosperity gospels, which is to say self-help. And so I have been reading every single self-help book that was ever published by the New York Times bestsellers list since 1920 blah blah. And that is what I do with my free time. <laughs> and then I make <laughs> spreadsheets, and then I think about it. Um, but what is kind of lovely for me in being able to kind of write out of my own experience but also do this work is I'm mostly just thinking about what, because to be honest, like I would say heresy, which is to say incorrect belief, but I really think of heresy as just a beautiful thing that doesn't transform us. And so we collect them, and then we sometimes find ourselves changed, but like into what? And so for me, the struggle is always trying to figure out what is the version of the hustle monster perfectibility thing that we're all given in, say, Peloton, um, and what is part of, of sanctification? Like in what way are we becoming 
kinder, more peace-loving, less chirpy, you know. And so uh, I guess that's been one of those wonderful kind of echo chamber effects that being a historian has had with my hopefully someday improving faith <laughs> is, is that it allows me to think about the beliefs that I collect that don't transform me. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about getting faith, belief, right, and, but it's not being dogmatic. It's that so many ways of thinking about God and faith are really toxic and they're yeah. really unhealthy for us. Anyway, uh, so back to your book, which is fabulous. Um, like positivity. Did you ever, do you ever think you'd be like a great devotional writer? <laughs> no. This was a bummer book I wrote by myself, and I love doing it because I don't know how to think honestly, spiritually, unless I try to practice yeah. praying. And so I think that's, I would never ever assume I would write devotionally until I was going through this. It turns out that because I had so many abdominal surgeries from um, so many years of treatment that it had really, uh, with my hypermobility, made it almost impossible for me to live without chronic pain. And then the pain got worse and worse and worse, and then pretty soon I was just kind of revolving around it like a human uh, drill, and I couldn't get out. So I only had about an hour every day in which I could think clearly, and so that's the only reason I started to really write devotionally, which was, it was sort of more like, dear God, today was another design flaw. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> Why this continues to happen. Best wishes, Kate. Um, so that's the spirit of um, attempting to live beautifully inside of the limitations I was experiencing. So that's part of how I try to think about writing beautiful, terrible devotionals. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's a gift to us who are pastors. We get people on Sunday, but you're sort of accompanying them through the week as they read and think about these things. So, so I love this one toward the beginning. It's called To Feel Wonder Again. Sometimes we don't feel much at all. We feel hollow. And you write, in moments of dull despair, I pray for wonder. I recently stumbled on uh, Rabbi uh, Joshua, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, I prayed for wonders mm. instead of happiness, mm. and God gave them to me. Mm. I love it. Talk about wonder. That's lovely. Yeah, well, I guess there's so many kinds of ways we can feel like wonder is never going to come to our doorstep again. <clears throat> and everybody else seems all full up. And <laughs> I guess some of the things I see is, I mean, for me, it was pain and then fear of pain, and that made my life very, very small. But for other people, it can be like too much awareness, anxiety, a, a vigilance that's sometimes a gift, but actually just feels like we're wearing it right now as a kind of second skin. And when you feel like that, it can be so difficult then to have anything feel new ever. And so, so much of, to me, what looking for wonder is, is trying to take that volume of fear and then not just say that faithful people can't be afraid and then pretend that we're shutting it to zero, but just kind of adjust the dial so that we can sort of start to hear other things. So is it a compliment you got that maybe you could listen to this time? Or maybe it's a person who wouldn't mind hearing that difficult story again and again. Or maybe it's my father-in-law's actual hearing aid. He was staying with me this week. He turns out that he is not turning up his hearing aid when he chooses not to. And I was like, doesn't it bother you not to hear my voice more often? And you paused, and I love Mennonites. And he was like, hmm, I guess I mostly just miss the birds. <laughs> <laughs> like, All right. <laughs> so I think volume setting is kind of key to hearing to being able to see what might be, might be new. Reminds me of the woman who came to our church who gradually grew deaf and she kept coming every Sunday. And so I sent her a note and I said, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see you, but yeah. why do you come? You can't hear my sermons. You can't hear the choir. You can't talk to people. She wrote me a note back and said, I don't really come for your sermons and I don't really come for the music. And I don't even really come for the other people. I come for God. It's like a lovely thing. She couldn't hear it. <laughs> like, how dare you, ma'am? My sermon was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, don't, please don't tell that story to my father-in-law. 
So that, so that fits right into what's over here on page 42. I love this. You have this knack for, um, and I did a podcast a while back with Walter Brueggemann, who's written a lot on the Psalms. And he says, well, what the Psalms do is they give us language to help us understand what we didn't understand we were feeling, right? Yeah. But because he supplies the, and you're great yeah. at that. So this one, you write, you can cheat, you can look. It's called For Everyday Funerals, all right? So you go to a funeral once in a while, but she says they're everyday funerals. Some are big and some are small. We feel the weight of our lives. We attend funerals every day. We see our endings. Last day of school, end of this love or that bit of youth, last touch of a warm paper-skinned hand, and so on. At uh, Christmas, we talked a lot about the first Christmas, first Christmas without her, the first mm. Christmas without yeah. a job, the first Christmas. Any, anyway, yeah. uh, you, you also added here, uh, uh, everyday funeral for an ability that you had. I circled that because I'm losing <laughs> so many of mine. Talk about that, everyday funerals. Mm. Like we, t we tend to we think do. loss is bad, yeah. and if we have faith, we'll feel better about the yeah. loss that we had. Because I have to admit, it drives me it drives me crazy when someone says something that is so painfully sweet that it could only be true in like an eternal way. Like, like when people say, and you'll see this on Instagram with clouds behind it, but some version of that nothing is lost. And we know, we know we're being lied to because we immediately can think of all the things we've lost, people we've lost, things that we'll never get back. And of course, our hope draws us to a story in which we hope that in God's arms, nothing is lost. But right now, don't lie to me. Right now, don't lie to me. And I, I just, I like the idea of being able to have a little bit more honesty around the things we gain and then the things we lose along the way. And it kind of reminds me of, um, my best friend Catherine is kind of a terrifying and wonderful person and she knew that I was really sad to move houses and I was of course very grateful to have any kind of new house but that the house that I was leaving was the house I had brought my son home to. It was the first home I'd ever bought that had an Elvis tribute room from the original owners. <laughs> Hopefully future houses will have these gifts. He, he wasn't um, alive in yeah, there though. That's right. No. The apparition in the mirror. Um, <laughs> it was like such a weird, beautiful experiment in growing up with my husband and I trying to renovate every room. Um, and I but it also was the thing where every time I opened a cupboard, it had old medical supplies, or it was just really hard to be in the place where I almost didn't, I almost lost it all. And so it was a great gift to move someplace new, so I should have just been happy, and I felt guilty that I wasn't just happy about being happy. And so Catherine came by in her like enormous super mom minivan, and like she's too cool for that van, but that's why it's cool that she drives that van. And she was like, get in. And I was like, all right. Um, we'd already sold the place, but you know you know the code on the door or whatever. So I was telling, I thought a very moving story uh, in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she just like pulls over as fast as she can, is like, and puts it in park. And then she just gets out. It was pouring rain, so it felt abrupt. And then she walked over to the sliding door opens it up, wordless, and then takes out enormous, I thought they looked like bolt cutters, but cutting shears, and then just walks away into the forest. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll just save that story for myself. <laughs> and then she comes back and she's got all these um, uh, balsam branches. And I was like, all right. Contextless, she drives away. She pulls up to the house that we're, my little bungalow that we're just about to sell. And she's like, all right, sweetie, it's time for your goodbyes. And I was like, okay. So we go inside. I'm already feeling very emotional. Just like, what a lovely thought. She had a bucket and she put water in it. And she had these big balsam branches. And then she's like, we're going to go into every room and we're going to bless it. We're going to say the loveliest, truest thing, the nicest thing that happened here, and then we're going to say the garbage, horrible thing that happened here, and then we're going to bless it. <laughs> so, we just went room by room. And it was exactly what I mean, I guess. 
my everyday funerals. Hello, living room. That was an ugly fight. Thank you for the family that gathered here. Goodbye. <laughs> What, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, the, the, there's a, uh, I see it in people and I feel it in myself when I look in the mirror. This uh, pressure, I think the Heschel thing really intrigues me. Instead of praying for happiness, yeah. I prayed for wonder. There's this uh, intense pressure in our society to be happy. Yes. And it's measured, I don't know how, how's it measured? You know. Facebook photos, everyone's smiling and chipper, uh, whatever. Yeah. What, what, what do you, how do, how do you do, it's not like it's bad to be happy, but what, how do, what do you make of the pressure to be happy and how do you, how do you lift some of that off yeah. people? What, what would your friendship counsel be? Yeah, well, it's been about, gosh, 140 years of uh, positive thinking in America. <laughs> and, um, it's so weird. It was like the very first popular theology when good housekeeping was started in the early 20th century. So if you ever wonder why you're supposed to be cheerful after reading a magazine, um, if you, or just like scrolling, you're like, why do I feel so happy? <laughs> it's not feeling. Um, but I think what's wrong about it in particular is that it convinced us that our minds are the most potent spiritual engines, that they're supposed to do all the spiritual work. And unfortunately, it divorces us from every other kind of context, from our bodies, from our emotions, from our context, from our histories, from structural inequality, from all the reasons we have to have a, a, a better story. And so then, and it's, it's really funny too, because like I know, like if I, if I looked through a library of any de demographic, I could tell you which story about happiness you were sold. Or like it went from a version of, oh man, the business let for dudes is, you're supposed to have, there's a rich dad, poor dad version. There's a CrossFit version. <laughs> there's a Norman Vincent Peale became Robert Schuller, became, <laughs> Dave Ramsey. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, for women, there's the Mary Kay to Joyce Meyer trajectory. There's the Rachel Hollis to, like, everybody got the same memo in a different package. And what is difficult about that is we don't always know the limitations of the stories we inherit. And the limitation of that story is that it transforms all tragedies into tests of character and it has made all of us into failures for those times in which we could not smile in the worst moments of our life. And I only say that because I am so genuinely, ridiculously determined to be optimistic. Wheeled into surgery, oh hi, hey there, hi. <laughs> this whole thing again? <laughs> okay, I suppose. <laughs> and it can be, there's versions of it that are beautiful and allow for our, the quality of our attention to shift for what is possible. Yeah. And then there's a cheap approximation of resilience in which it forces us all to master emotion in a way that's actually just a different way of broadcasting that we're winners. And we need to practice not being quite so winning. And it requires a huge amount of uh, pretending yeah. that is exhausting. Yeah. And it, and it keeps us from relationships, right? If I'm gonna be friends with Bert, I have to be able to say, Bert, here's some, I'm really hurting. Uh, and I hope Bert can deal with that, right? But instead of saying, oh, Bert, I'm fine, how are you? That's Bert, yes. Can you deal with it, Bert? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think what's hard, though, about telling Bert, whose kindly face makes me wanna tell him my problems, um, <laughs> is that most of our friends have heard it before at least a dozen times. Yeah. And that's because most of us don't have new problems we have the same problem over and over and over again, which makes us feel ridiculous the 12th time we need help. But that's the, I mean, that's maybe like the hardest part of interdependence, how we don't get always to see that we're magically getting better, that we often mostly just feel like we're just playing whack-a-mole. And then we hope that Caitlin wants to listen again. Again. 
So that feeds right into on page 64. This is so interesting. So you write here, uh, it's more honest to admit that we were born hungry, and the hunger doesn't stop as the years go by. And you do the thing again. Friends may congratulate me for whatever, but here I am, incomplete somehow. I love this phrase. I'm playing checkers with my life, and the world is playing chess. (laughs) That's a great line. But then I love this. I did not invent hope. Oh, Lord, you gave it to me. Now teach me what to hope for. Right? We get confused about what to hope. Like, I want to be hopeful, but maybe you're hoping for something that's going to be a false thing. So here's, I promised my wife I would ask you this question. She and her friend Amy talk about this. The que- something bizarre will happen, and they'll say, what is wrong with people? It's kind of a coping thing, but that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. What is wrong with… I, grow, yeah. The little bit of church I went to growing up, I heard that what's wrong is sin. Uh-huh. And then sometime in seminary, I read this guy, Douglas John Hall, and he says what's wrong with people is we're like Sisyphus trying to push this rock up the hill, mm. and we're just so dang tired, yeah. and the rock keeps rolling down. Yeah. What's wrong with people? <laughs> <laughs> I don't hear you saying I, sin is you know, what's wrong with I people. I do kind of love that because cause one of the things I, I guess I think of about most as a historian is the way that our estimation of what we ought to be able to accomplish inside of a day, a week, a year, a life, that's what we, like, what we call our, uh, an anthropology, an account of people, what is good about people, what is wrong with people, Um, is that our estimation, in terms of the stuff that we're sold, is way too high. I mean, it it has no, it it is entirely devoid of our finitude, our frailty, and our need for other people. It's just absent. But the problem then is, and it's fun, thank you for letting me solve the, I mean, are Pentecostals right? Are Lutherans right? All Lutherans are always right. They don't like it when you say that, so you should repeat it. But trying to have an accurate account of what people are capable of is genuinely something I'm obsessed with. I think maybe it came actually out of studying uh, faith healers for so long, Hmm. is I saw how much people had to figure out, especially when their lives were unbelievably difficult, how to participate in any process that would try to lift them out of their situation. And I was seeing these like far too surreal things that they were supposed to reach for. But there were other people who just kind of lay down and never got up again. Hmm. And I I just, I thought about them all the time, Hmm. is what allows people to try, what, what lets them push a boulder up the hill a little bit and what is gonna constantly get them leveled. And so I think I think a little, it's, this, it's the same question as the sin, which is what are we capable of? Hmm. And having an accurate account of what I, limited agency, the ability to act, is a kind of personal obsession. And how do we encourage people into a place where they feel like they're allowed the vulnerability and interdependence to actually make any change when our lives often feel utterly unchangeable? Yeah, and they're, so I know plenty of people that they expect way too much of themselves and others. I, I grew up in a household where I was kind of told, you'll never be any good. So it wasn't that yeah. too much expectation, there was a net, you, you'll yeah. probably Oh, Mennonites fail. are into this, yeah. Our, our gender balance is like way the heck off tonight. You mean perfect. <laughs> you mean utterly perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Every, every time I speak at a graduation, I say, guys, put the women in charge. The guys had their turn, <laughs> and not so good. But anyway, uh, I know women, though, here, some personally, that because of their gender, uh, there were kind of, there were some limited understandings of what they might yeah. be. So I wonder how that plays out, right? Yeah. And theologically, most of us were not offered um, natural self-esteem. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> um, and should, should, I, be, should be. And our, I mean, I, to be totally honest, I, I'm somebody who one of my first responses is shame. Why was it me? 
it was probably something about me. What could I have done? And it's because of how I grew up, and I, or, <laughs> but in every version, I find that as a kind of like load bearing uh, project. On my own, I can't be built very high. And it is a very awkward metaphor, and my poor friends have to suffer it. But I was like, look, naturally, I don't have, I think, what's known as self-esteem. Uh, that's where your love comes in. On my own, um, I'm a building that's kind of a ground floor, a mm. real sub-basement, and I can get like one max two stories high. And. Uh, I was talking with, this was on that uh, Portugal trip with my dad, we were talking a lot about arch, uh, um, architecture, and he was like, do you remember the time in the Middle Ages where they just like forgot how to build buildings? And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. It just stayed squat. And then um, he's like, yeah, and then they kind of added those outside um, reinforcements called uh, buttresses, and eventually they made them look fancy, but for the most part, they're there just because uh, that whole thing is uh, really just never gonna survive. And that is entirely how I think about self-worth or the ability then to grow in love is on my own, I'm about two stories tall, but with love and a lot of flying buttresses, like I can get can some decorative glass up there if I'm really, this guy could do something like this. Um, and my friends don't love being called flying buttresses anymore. Um, <laughs> but it is the best image I know for friendship and love if you happen to be one of those people who don't naturally feel that, that lovely, bubbly, you got it girl feeling. One thing we, we talked about this before we walked in the room. I, I, earlier in the day, I thought the uh, gender imbalance would be four to one. I lost that lottery, it's like way <laughs> off. And I told you that back there and you said, oh, of course, it's women who come. Why, what? Why is that? Why do you think so many women are resonate with you? I mean, I don't want to ask why guys don't. We're just dolts sometimes, but yeah. I know what I need. I need more honesty in my life than our culture allows me in a regular week. I need more vulnerability than I'm allowed at a party. <laughs> And I need more <laughs> interdependence, which is I, to say people who sign up to run errands when I'm embarrassed that I can't carry my life. And that, I think, is something that many women are saddled with, those kinds of feelings. But I would say, in particular, when we have gone through something, it's either the things we endure that level us, or it's the fact that our loves are so expensive. We are not leveled by like, oh, we, we constantly go to Guam and it's really just draining our bank accounts. You know, too many beach vacations and self-care for us, <laughs> bubble baths. <laughs> no, it's just that everybody is caring for other people so much. And so a lot of the discussions we've been able to have on the Everything Happens podcast or just part of the community is that people lead emotionally expensive lives. <laughs> and I would say that women in particular carry most of that weight and that's why I am grateful grateful that those are the, the people I get to talk to most. I mean, I feel like your project would help with something I talked about in a sermon I don't know, recently, two weeks ago, I think it was, where I said a lot of times if you take the chance to tell somebody something in your life, uh, too many people do two things. The first thing, in front of you, they'll smile and go, oh. Inside, they resort to pity. Well, nobody really wants to be pitied, but the second thing that they resort to is blame. So if, if I say, I have a child that is deeply troubled, people say, oh, but inside they're thinking, you must have done something hmm. wrong, right? And that makes you not want to share with anybody because they think you did something. You don't want pity or that. So I tend to think your approach to things can help with that if people would take it seriously, don't you hmm. think? I mean, isn't part of your project to help people give people the permission to open up and love each other? That's Isn't funny. that, that be yeah. buttresses for one another? Yeah, I would, I'm just thinking of all the, like the very first book I wrote, I, I just received so much um, 
like a a accidentally alienating commentary that I just like went into the <laughs> other room and wrote an appendix of like, wouldn't it be nice if you said this to me instead? Like n no sentence that starts with at least. <laughs> yes. And it turns out everybody feels the exact same way. Um, <laughs> but we aren't, we don't have a lot of natural ways of relating to each other that don't accidentally put them on the other side of, of glass again. Hmm. So that is kind of, because I study cultural scripts, I guess that is kind of one of my favorite things is to try to like, we can all help rewrite them. Like surely we can, like I, ha I had a really nice, and has nothing to do with like how much exposure someone often has to the problem. I had a really nice <laughs> faculty member um, who was like, I also had a terrible disease. Um, here's a blender and a juicing thing. That should probably do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I think we're beyond juicing. But, <laughs> but like free blender, like I'm, I'm not gonna turn down a free blender. So I was like, definitely this, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <sighs> so I'm open to a page that's not funny. I, I do this when I teach preaching, though. I think the role of humor, sometimes you get people to laugh, and then you open up a place, and they're ready to deal with something painful. So let's try this. You're like, this is horrible. 42. So here, here's an entry called, The Pain is Too Much. Yeah. And you talk about a painting where something terrible is going on, but everybody else in the background is they're just minding their business. It reminds me of the, the introduction to Tuesdays with Maury, where Maury's diagnosed with cancer and he looks out the window and people are carrying their shopping bags. He's like, How can they just be carrying on? I'm yeah. dying. And yeah. anyway, it's interesting. It was like this poor man. One time I came out of a hospital and this poor man had the audacity to be like eating a decorative salad. And I was like, Must be nice. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Volumes too no, I mean, high. You are that man out there. I'm very sorry. That was, that was too much. So then with a beautiful eloquence and theological wisdom, you know, you're talking to God. I'm busy telling you I will never survive this, and you tell me the truth, talking to God. You never poison me with the lie that God gives you what you can handle. You say instead that you promise, you swear, an oath made in your blood that this suffering will never outlast this love. Tell me again, God, about how love goes on forever. That's just beautiful. But, it, but, it, but it's, not, it's not like, oh, she writes well. That's not it. Uh, there's something in your heart that let you go there. What do you think that is? Like, how, do you, how do you get... They, I, I can't get up in the morning and write that. Oh, it's just, dis it's despair. It really is. It's, it's, it's when the noise of everything I can't change is so loud that I think, God, there is nothing truer about me than this. And then I have to sort of be talked back into love. God, didn't you promise that you love the brokenhearted? Like, didn't you promise that you actually kind of will seek us out in every corner. Also, isn't despair me saying again and again that this will never change and that there is not a single bit of light that filters in? So then I just have to like adjust the aperture until I can feel that God and love is somehow truer. But at the time, Every problem, I mean, what is despair except the belief that it will never end? Yeah. I mean, there's no um, platitude in this. It's not preachy. It's got a little bit of a kind of like Job crying out to God, but yet it's crying out to God, yeah. right? It's like, you promised. I mean, I love that. It made me think about... Um, in the Song of Solomon 8.6, it's got this verse that love is as strong as death. Mm, that's beautiful. And when we were reading this when I was uh, in graduate school, uh, my professor Roland Murphy pointed out that this guy named Marvin Pope, who's a scholar at Yale, that he prefers to translate it, love is stronger than death. He says, scholars criticize him for this, but what they don't know is that while he was working on his commentary, his wife died of cancer. Mm, yeah. So for him, yeah. He took a bold step to say, not love is the strongest death, but love yeah. is stronger 
than death. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you had times you thought you would die. Yeah. Yeah, that was a stretch. Yeah, I guess, I don't know what I thought would happen. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if I thought, I think maybe at first I just thought that a person of faith was supposed to land on a particular feeling. And then I kind of just found that I had every feeling. But the one that weirdly didn't go away was, was hunger. Like, I, I remember this doctor friend of mine, he was like, it seems like you're okay for most of the day, but for, you know, I was like, are, he's like, are you? And I was like, I'm okay for about five to 10 minutes a day. And he was like, what, is that, what does that feel like? And I was looking out at my son who had just gotten this, we'd gotten him this absolutely age inappropriate electric tractor and he was just like crashing over and over again into the garage door and I said, it feels like I'm hungry and I'll never be full again. And I thought maybe that hunger was like a sign that I wasn't doing it right, like I wasn't getting somewhere. Like shouldn't you kind of feel like love fills you up and then congratulations, ta-da, aren't you like a wonderful person? And I guess I just found that like Hunger is like the sign of love. Like there's never gonna be a moment where I like held my giant goober face kid and was like, well, I guess that's it, good job. Enough love. (laughs) I just, like more becomes more becomes more. And so I guess now life feels a lot like hunger. And that's, I guess, how I know that I'm awake enough to, to be able to look at the day and say like, all right, God, in every possible way, I want it all. The, um, you know, you have the line, tell me again, God, about how love goes on forever. I don't know if you know this because you're a mom and there are some moms out here. There's a song by somebody we love named Dara Williams. She's envisioning the day that she will send her child away. Mm. And I love her lyric, it goes, uh, you'll fly away, but take my hand until that day. And when they ask how far love goes, when my job's done, you'll be the one who knows. Mm. I get emotional just saying those words to you. Yeah. It's a lovely thing. You have yeah. a child, right? Yeah, yes. I have a Zach. Zach. Zach is in the piracy years. He is in the, in the Calvin and Hobbes and dragon-like is that a room or just a pile of things you found today stage? Like pockets, pockets of rocks. It doesn't make any sense. How's he, how old is he? 10. 10? What a great age. What a maddening age. <laughs> all the above. Um, <laughs> I, lately, when I walk into a room, he finds a way to cram himself into the smallest space out of sight line. And I put my feet up in the coffee table. There's only this much room under, and it's just his bulbous head wedged on the side. I was like, good job, buddy. <laughs> like, like, I don't understand what they want. So we're drawn to my last couple of questions, but uh, you have one here covered for a cluttered mind. God, my brain is a junk drawer. Like, I love that. That works for me. And you use the whack-a-mole image. I, I, that's really perfect. That's what people do, right? Yeah. If you're awake at night, you have your worries. It's like, uh, you, you, you can't <laughs> whack them all down. And I love this. Yeah, Lord, we will put down the mallet. I know we can do it. Short breath in, short breath out. Again, again, put down the mallet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can love that. What, how do you, so you have these amazing conversations with the Matthew McConaughey's and Ann Patchett's and amazing people. How does, how do, what do you learn from them? How do they stretch you? How do those impact your work? Oh my gosh, because it's, because they, there's a weird uh, magic that can only live inside of somebody else and then in the words you make together, like in building a dumb joke with a friend and then you add something and then they add something and then all of a sudden like a thing exists that didn't exist before. And the way I structure a podcast is I ask about eight questions where I'm just so excited about their work and I wanna showcase it, but I pretty much know what they're gonna say and I'm excited about it. Then the last couple I'm like, oh boy, where are we going? (laughs) 
And those are the ones where somebody always like gives me the gift of a phrase that I never would have had before. And I say a lot, like I really think a lot of my language comes from just the gift of that magic. Like I had one guest who talked who said, well, um, that there was, she was like, well, you know, I, when I meet somebody else who's gone through something, I really know it's the fellowship of the afflicted. I'm like, oh, that's gonna stick with me. Fellowship of the afflicted. But I, d I do feel like they sort of, they, they kind of mine the, you know what it is? It's because I'm so anti-cliche and I spend most of my life thinking about how to ruin cliches for other people. <laughs> Like just in There's, case, there so just in case they liked them and had some comfort by them, um, then I ruin it. Um, but I guess that's what feels so magical about when there's the perfect freight. Like um, Tara Westover, that conversation. Like every time you can name a name, I can think of a lovely little gift they gave me. And the Tara Westover one, she was talking about, so it's a story it's called Educated. If you haven't read it, it's a beautiful Fabulous. book. But she grows up in this survivalist family and, um, and she, it becomes quite <clears throat> self educated It's a story about her, the transformation and the separation between her and her family as a result of her being, um, becoming increasingly educated. And she goes to Oxford, et cetera, et cetera. But she looks back on what her, the impact of her family and how much the cliche then is the parents, the people want to say, well, your parents did their best. <laughs> And then, right, you can feel how that <laughs> squeezes you into a corner where now you're not allowed to say, well, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, it's like, so because, so she said the perfect thing, she said. I can say they did their best, and their best was devastating. And I'm like, boo, that was, so yeah. These that, that's when I stopped the podcast. I thought, I can't, I want to hear the rest. Yeah. I got to ponder that a while. It was beautiful. I guess it's these sort of, because what we want is we understand why people have the cliche, because they offer a sort of a 60% of a lovely thing. <laughs> but you want, you want the richer truth, and you can feel it when somebody gives it to you. So that always feels like the tremendous gift, honestly, of, of, like spirit, of the, like, that transcendent little language. Do you have any other kind of pleasant surprises that came out of a conversation? That... Some people are terrible, and I edit that uh, out. Uh, no. <laughs> I want you to know if someone was really mean, you'll never know. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you guess. We'll do it for just joking. <laughs> <laughs> who, was, who was good? Who, who did those surprised you? And... Well, um, Beth Amore and Rabbi Steve Leader said something that was kind of two sides of the same really helpful thought. Because one of the cliches, I guess, is um, basically, uh, some version of the fact that you have to make everything count, right? That there's always a lesson, and then when you go through something horrible, if you didn't find the lesson, you know, you're a failure in some way. And Beth said one really beautiful thing about it, where she said, um, God, like, I've been through so much pain, and I'm not saying there's any reason for it, but could you make it matter? And I loved the idea that, like, that there can be a golden thread that's woven through after just to be given back to you, not to be some punishment on you for not having found it in the first place. Mm. And then I really liked when Rabbi Steve Leader said, um, but if you have to go through hell, just don't, just don't leave empty-handed. Mm. And then I loved that thought, mm. too, of, like, in the midst of the fires, which is not designed to hurt you. It's not there to make you, it's just like to teach you some terrible lesson. But if you find this glittering thing, you're allowed to put it in your pocket. I liked, I liked all of those so much better than, you know, everything happens to teach oh. you some oh. thing to put on a card for later. Oh my gosh, I got the best note the other day. And this is the other thing. I get such, it's the community, everything happens community is art, to be quite frank, like the greatest people I meet. You really are the best. You do the most wonderful and hilarious things. And this wonderful woman wrote to me the other day to say, I lost, I lost my mom last week. It's been truly horrible. So my family all got together outside and we lit a bonfire and then we read out loud every horrible and well-meaning card we'd received over the last <laughs> two years. 
we dedicate this to you. And then we burned it and threw it into the fire. And I was like, no one is as great as you. I love you. <laughs> I've been a number of times been about to conduct a funeral and I'm with a family where it's a terrible situation. Yeah. And I told them about uh, this gift my mother gave to my children. My mother not gifted at this. She had been at a Cracker Barrel and she saw some napkins that were cute and she Xeroxed the napkins <laughs> and sent one to each of my children. They're As like, opposed to buying what? two napkins? <laughs> anyway, so I tell people before the funeral, I say, there's some people that will hand you some Xerox napkins. This is for you, they in, say solemnly. In the receiving line, and it's, it's well intended. Oh and my gosh. Anyway, <laughs> too funny. <laughs> I, I kept one, I have to admit, anyway. Uh, what are you? What, what's, what's next for you? What are you working on? Like, we, we want more. Like, what, what's oh, coming? Uh, well, actually, it's funny. It was advice from Ann Patchett. She, she, like, she walks, um, and this is walking. It's with hands, and I don't know if you've done it before, but it's mostly with hands. Um, and she was like, uh, this was her last, last book before Tom Lake, and she was like, I'm writing a really happy book. And she didn't mean this in a mean way, but she was like, you should try it. <laughs> So I'm, I'm writing a book about joy. She had a saucy edge that <laughs> surprised me for some she is reason. A, she's a sassy lady. Like, I've loved yeah. her books, but I didn't feel that edge that she had on your podcast. She's the a other, winner. Just quick. So Beth, so Beth Moore, I, I don't know why, years ago, for some reason, I had a, eh, some apprehensions about Beth Moore. But then she seems to have morphed, and you guys have become... Oh, she's a miracle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so just yeah. real quick, tell about, to, about what you see with, with her. I know oh, you love sure. her. Oh, sure. And uh, I have to say one of the best books I read in the last couple years was um, her gorgeous memoir. If you haven't read it, it's called All My Knotted Up Life. And you read it and you think, um, this is a woman who loves Jesus when every structure in her life ought to have told her that she was worthless. And yet it gave her this, like, spine of faith that allowed her to stand taller and it feels like a miracle when you're close to it. So, and she bought me socks, and I was out of socks. So, <laughs> she is a perfect person, yeah. Uh, Kate, this has been a, a wonderful time. You guys, thank you this is for a, being Thank with you us. so much for this, and to this spectacular community of givers. I, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> So we do this sometimes in our church. I want you to join with me in doing this. I want you to repeat after me. Oh, boy. Right? Okay. I'm nervous. And I want you to actually want to bless Kate. So what if it was mean, though? <laughs> you were like... <laughs> so if, if you're into this kind of thing, like, you can kind of rate, like we're laying hands on her, right? I'll take it. You can do it. Come on. It's not going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so repeat after me. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. For your wonderful work. For your wonderful work. We love you. Aww. We bless you. Thank you. We thank God for you. <laughs> Come see us again. <laughs> thank you, guys. Aww, that was wonderful.